Dr. Russell and Dave Brown right along ringside. By golly, we're about ready to go with more big action. Thank you very much, and welcome to Georgia Championship Wrestling. I'm Gordon Sola, your host, and we have quite an hour in store for us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Championship Wrestling at ringside. This is Vince McMahon, along with wrestling's only living legend, Bruno Sammartino. Welcome to this week's edition of Mid-South Wrestling Television. I'm your host, Boyd Pierce, another outstanding card. Hey guys, and welcome back to the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories. I am, of course, Ray Russell, and this week, guys, we dive back into Memphis, 1985. And in order to do that, going to bring back our special guest co-host, Mr. Memphis, Mr. Moneybags. Here he is, Gene Jackson. Gene, welcome back to the program. Moneybags, Gene Jackson. Oh, if only that were true, right? If only that were true. But, well, uh, I used it. I used it on Patreon, bro. I had to do it here. For the masses, yes, it's <laughs> it's uh it's an inside joke that uh, <laughs> it just keeps giving. It does, uh, and I won't bother to I love it. <laughs> won't bother to explain. Join Patreon, and maybe there's a clue there. I won't say here, but uh, <laughs> hey, man, I'm excited to head back to 1985 to see what the next adventure is for our friend Sweet Daddy Seeky. Oh was my so god, captivating last time around. As long as Tom Ernesto has the book, you never know what's going to happen here in the Memphis Territory, circa 1985, Gene. And uh, as we always do, let's go back and recap last week in the Memphis Territory as Sweet Daddy Siki finally arrives in Memphis and, quite frankly, makes the quickest face turn in all of wrestling history. I don't know if you can turn face before you debut, Gene, but it seems like that's what he did. If somebody out there listening can name us a faster face turn than Sweet Daddy Seeky in Memphis in 1985, I would love to hear about it and see it, because I can't imagine what that would be. <laughs> Same here. Also, another new arrival, Jerry Oski, uh, the Jer the future Jerry Allen in the World Wrestling Federation. Jerry Oski arrives, and he must have flown in from Connecticut because, boy, was his arms tired. Completely out of Ew. breath was completely out of breath was Oski there. Hey, but his mom's from Chattanooga, so you guys better like him down here. Come on, guys, give him a chance. His mom's from Chattanooga. He's <laughs> uh he's trying his best. Damn Yankee up there in Connecticut of all places <laughs> from the I think he was from Hartford or, or somewhere around that area. Oh my god, it was a it was just a busy week last week as not only does Oski show up, not only does sweet daddy Siki finally make that trip from Europe. But also, the PYTs are back. Talking about Coco Ware and Norvell Austin. And boy, talk about Coco busting heads. Bustin certainly makes him feel good. Ah, so that's why they call it the Ghostbuster. It's the only logical reason I could think of. There's no other reason you would call a brain buster a Ghostbuster. But then again, it's a wonder more guys didn't turn into a ghost after taking it. Good <laughs> Lord, has he ever seen anyone apply a brain buster in a more dangerous way than Coco Ware. And it wasn't a one-off. They just keep no. coming. <laughs> well, there's a teaser for later in this program. Another epic ghost buster, brain buster, call it what you will, on the way here later in this episode of Regional Wrestling. Stay tuned for that, guys. As uh, David Johnson apparently owed the Macho Man a lot of money because holy shit. That was an epic, like, not until years later when the moon dogs would just slaughter people week in and week out on, on television did we see a poor enhancement guy <laughs> take the kind of just absolute beating that David Johnson took. I, like you said, and uh, he either owed him money or he, he looked cross-eyed at Elizabeth because, man, it seemed personal. I feel like... Uh, maybe three occasions, Savage kept pitching him outside, hitting that top rope double axe handle to the studio floor, and then back in the ring for another diving elbow. And then for good measure, at the end of the matchup, another double axe handle to the floor as they were trying to escort poor David out of the studio. And in between all of that, my favorite part, for absolutely no reason whatsoever, Randy Savage grabbing David by his ankles on the floor and just dragging him around the studio. Going to scrape off the word David from his ass. <laughs> Like, like, like a Sopranos cast member dragging off a dead body after they've <laughs> whacked somebody. He's just, just dragging him across the floor like a corpse. I feel like this is not one of the clips that the Fink or Jimmy Hart would have shown Vince McMahon in order to get Savage hired. No, definitely not. <laughs> well, uh, the Fabulous Ones were also in studio last week as Stan Lane assured the world that getting a title shot against the Fabs was as easy as the girls in Memphis. 
Just kidding. No, you weren't, Stan. <laughs> I tell you what, man. Stan has been on it here lately on these promos. Uh, I mean, his voice always stood out to me. Mm-hmm. But I do not remember Stan being as witty in uh, yes. uh, these promos as he has been lately. You got to pay attention to these Stan Lane promos because he's dropping some bombs in there. And there's more to come this week. You know, I think it's just the Cornette syndrome. Corny talked so long for Stan, and Stan would get his shots in, but not like he's getting to do here with no manager by his side. Stan Lane basically, I don't want to say carrying the team as far as promos go, Kern holding up his own, but Kern's cutting your typical babyface promo or wrestling promo, and Stan Lane's just coming out here saying, let's see what I can do this week to piss somebody off. He is the wild card these days, and I'm digging it. Oh, as am I. Uh, One of the wild hogs was here last week. He had a weird disappearing act mid-match during a tag team. We kind of hypothesized maybe he shat himself. Not really sure what happened there, but sure hope he's okay. I just started getting into the team. They even got gear, and it looks like one of them have already disappeared, and now the other one may uh, may be on the way out sooner rather than later. Yeah, it's very weird, man. They 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 show up and then they completely change their look a week later, and now one of them's a wall, and one of them clearly. If he hadn't shat himself, something strange happened. But <laughs> yeah. I mean, you have to consider it's definitely on the table that somebody that calls himself a wild hog, that could have happened during a match. Well, uh, one last piece of business last week. The macho man, Randy Savage, sending Jerry Lawler to the hospital in Memphis after their rematch at the Mid-South Coliseum. But more on that here as we begin the TV program. However, Gene, uh, the one and only Steve Crawford has done it yet again, believe it or not. Good. We can always count on Steve Crawford to come through with the dirt. Lend us a helping hand, Mr. Crawford. He wrote in and said, listening to the latest Memphis Regional Wrestling Podcast this morning, guys, regarding Sweet Daddy Seeky, per the late Scott Bowden, the initial idea was supposed to bring Seeky in as a heel. We knew that. However, (laughs) Crawford goes on here. He says, when Seeky arrived and looked to be 110 years old, the decision was made to turn him babyface. Also, like you said, Ray, it seemed like he was ready to walk out the door the second after he walked in. Well, now I feel a little better because, you know, I went back and listened to that podcast and I was like, well, man, maybe me and Ray was a little stiff on Sweet Daddy Seeky, you know, where he's kind of going on and on about how old he looked, but it wasn't just us. Apparently everybody realized yeah, he I don't, I don't, Yeah, I don't think that was just us. I mean, sometimes <laughs> I, I look back and I go, okay. Maybe a little stiff, but having fun, you know, you know, you got to make everybody laugh every once in a while. But at the same time, you know, that was a topic we were dead serious about. And uh, obviously, I think everybody seems to agree, including the bookers and promoters and things of that nature. And uh, Sweet Daddy Seeky, somehow they got him to stay around for another week because he's still here on the Memphis territory, at least at least for another day or two. Well, thank goodness, because I'm here for it. As am I, and we're going to have more from Steve Crawford here after this episode of CWA TV, but before we can get to Steve, we got to get through this, and I can't wait, I've been dying to get back to Saturday Morning TV right here in the Memphis studio, TV5, it's time for more CWA Championship Wrestling. Right away we go, Gene. It's Lance and Dave. No, that's not Dave Brown. That's Eddie Marlin sitting along ringside with Lance Russell. Wow, that's a, kind of an interesting pair. Uh, apparently, Lance has brought Marlin out here because of the significance of a situation that took place this past week at the Mid South Coliseum. Lance asking Marlin to discuss said situation. Well, you know, we're starting off serious from right out of the gate. We've got to have Eddie Marlin out here to address a situation. So we're like, man, what has happened? And clearly no room for three people at the table. So Dave Brown going to take a hike nowhere in sight. Uh, Don't worry, Dave Brown will return later in the program. But right now we go back to the Mid-South Coliseum, a VTR of the rematch between the new Southern champion, Randy Savage, taking on the former champ many times over, Jerry the King Lawler. 
And it seems Lawler has Savage pinned here in the clip when Tux Newman interferes to draw the disqualification. And then, of course, that upsets Lawler getting cost the belt, so he sets Tux up for a pile driver. But Macho Man blindsiding the king, pitching him outside to deliver that patented flying double axe handle off the top rope down to the concrete floor. And then it's back in the ring for the Macho Man to deliver his own pile driver. And then the shiny gold firewood holder is back into play here. Good to see they used it, used that prop more than once here, Gene. Sitting the stage yes. is all it was. <laughs> he brought it to TV because he knew he was going to use it at the Coliseum. Gotta respect that. Foreshadowing. So Savage pulls out the old golden whatever the hell that really is here. <laughs> Referee Jerry Calhoun trying to aid Lawler, trying to help out the king, but he gets knocked outside, does the referee, and thrown across the timekeeper's table for his troubles. And then back in the ring, the macho man going to pile drive Lawler again on the gold plate, straightening it out in the process. I wrote LOL. <laughs> Yes, you know Savage means business when he damages his gold plate <laughs> title display and for the sake of breaking the king's neck. And, of course, you know Lawler's upset because Savage just took out his shortstop on his softball team. So uh, there's a lot happening right here. There's a lot going on in the ring right now. And I have to think back as crafty as uh, Savage was, he probably planned this from the beginning. I'm going to do this pile driver, and it's going to bend this thing straight. It's going to look great. Aha! Uh-huh. And he does it here in the ring as he holds it up and shows everyone, look, see? I bent the plate on Lawler's head as the Macho Man then back up to the top rope, delivering not one, but two flying elbow drops. But with the Southern title in hand, dropping the Southern championship across the throat, the chest of one Jerry the King Lawler. Savage then grabbing the house mic, standing on the ringside table, mocking the King and taunting the fans. As we see an ambulance pull into the Mid-South Coliseum, a neck brace applied to the King, and Lawler is stretchered out of the building, straight to the ambulance and off to the hospital. And uh, all throughout the video clip, I should point out, we hear Lance, Russell, Eddie Marlin giving their take on the situation and the potentially injured neck of one Jerry Lawler. And let's not overlook the pile driver, too. Now the king, he probably has cancer. Oh, my God. We know, yeah, how uh, potentially fatal those pile drivers can be. And, uh, yeah, I just had two things running through my head while watching this this whole thing transpire and one is what you just said is oh my god let's hope the king hasn't contracted cancer from his pile driver and the other <laughs> right. thing is i couldn't help but think within a few days that lanny had to look at randy and go where are we going to put the firewood now <laughs> well no yeah you know they don't want to pay the gas bill <laughs> chop down That's another right. tree lanny <laughs> Oh, that dang man. sword he carries around wearing that suit of armor. Oh, oh the suit of armor. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a spoiler. We're going to get into that in just a moment, guys. So uh, here we go. We get we, right out of the gate. We see Eddie Marlin out here. So it's serious, folks. The storyline here is the Jerry Lawler taken out on a stretcher to the hospital. And uh, we don't know exactly his condition at this point in time. But immediately after the video, we're interrupted by the macho man, brother Lanny Poffo and Tux Newman. Newman claiming we've seen the last of the Jerry Lawler here in Memphis, and he wants to talk about new things, including an upcoming video package here from the Poem Laureate himself. We cut away to a VTR of Leaping Lanny Poffo in his famous or infamous suit of armor in front of a fucking castle. And more on that in just a moment. Not Castle Cornet, by the way. We see Lanny Poffo out here reciting a poem. I'm going to ask you, Gene, you've been all over Tennessee all over Kentucky. Tell me, where the hell is this castle? I don't know. I was wondering the same thing. And I'm <laughs> like, well, this is too early in time to, uh, for, I don't think this is any green screen trickery or anything. No. He looks <laughs> like he's legit in front of a castle. But, you know, in all seriousness, you know, we kind of glossed over that and, and had a couple of laughs. But, I mean, this is this is some of the most serious stuff we've seen in a while. Long time. Watching 85, and they put, they put Lawler in some real peril here. They put some real heat on Savage, which in turn has put some heat on old Tux Newman. And then we go straight from that into this silly shit of Lanny Poffo's out and get right, reading a poem in front of a freaking castle. Well, it got, just feels counterproductive. Yeah, well, that's a good word for a counterproductive. But at the same time, I'm uh, figuring the macho man ordered for this. So you let my brother do something right here, right now. Uh-huh. And this is what Lanny came up with. Standing in a suit of armor in front of a fucking castle, reciting a poem, as only Lanny Poffo can do. You can't make this up, guys. 
and it is clearly severely windy for this on-site poetry re- reading. As you can see, yes. the castle flags flying, and I mean windy, guys. So obviously, there's no way the original audio could be used here. So we get the video overdubbed with another reading of Papo reading the same poem in what seems to be equally bad audio. It's just, it's just, ter- it's just terrible from beginning to the production, if you want to call it that, of Memphis 85, not so hot. Yeah, I, if if Lanny had worn that freaking suit armor, armor, that wind probably would have blown him over. <laughs> it was blowing so hard. Yeah, but yeah, man, this felt like. I mean, I had to look, make sure this video hadn't switched over to like a SCTV skit or something. Like, it didn't even feel like something from the wrestling show. It was just so out of place. But like you said, I'm sure in Lanny's mind, you know, when he comes, like, what are you gonna do, Lanny? What if I was reading a poem in a suit of armor in front of a castle? Good grief. Is, is that his idea of heat? Like, in my, do you think in Lanny Poffo's mind, he's like, oh, yeah, this is good shit, man. This is going to get so much heat. Dude, uh, I can't put myself in Lanny Poffo's mind to save my life. I can't. I could never figure that cat out, man. I just I just couldn't. Yeah, I can't bend down that far. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, I wanted to grab this poem as a soundbite, but again, the audio is so muffled, it wouldn't have made uh, for a great listen here. Uh, what the hell? Let's do it anyway. Yes. Jerry Lawler was defeated one, two, three. The macho man dethroned the king, his destiny fulfilled. Max Newman got the title shot, and Lawler's hopes were killed. Lance Russell played some video on how they done him wrong. Eddie Marlin forced the rematch, which didn't take too long. The king tried to regain his crown and almost lost his head. The rematch was futility. He should have stayed in bed. They rushed him to the hospital. His hands got quite a scare. They say he is recovering, but I don't really care. I read the crowning of the king. I studied every page. Not a word about the macho man. That filled his heart with rage. The kingdom of Jerry Lawler has got an awful smell. More vile than the putrid slime which lines the gates of hell. He would like to hang the macho man before he's even tried. What was called attempted murder was really suicide. The wrestling fans have memories of Lawler's winning smile. Now he's just like Jackie Fargo, defeated and senile. The risk was worth the great reward in Jerry Lawler's fall. The Southern Heavyweight Champion. that I stand before, once proud with noble name, is now like Jerry Lawler, whose head is bowed in shame. So the poem is about the story which has just transpired over the last couple weeks, Gene. The Randy Savage beating Jerry Lawler for the Southern title, and then of course the rematch, where the king almost lost his head. He should have stayed in bed. What a great rhyme here by the poem laureate. Lanny then reading Jerry Lawler's book, he says, and not a word in it about the Macho Man, which filled Randy Savage's heart with rage. Now that I buy. Don't want to mention me, huh? Man, I mean, uh, not until later on when PN News arrives would we have such (laughs) grand poetry on a wrestling show. My goodness. Uh, But yeah, the funniest thing to me is what you pointed out is you take the horribly windblown audio and replace it with audio that was barely better than what the original audio was. It's <laughs> it's humorous, unintentionally humorous. <laughs> Absolutely. And then, of course, you hear stories later on, Lanny Poffo telling the story about Chief J. Strongbow purposely not booking Angelo Poffo into that Legends Battle Royal on a house show for the WWF, and Randy Savage never forgot about it. He hated Strongbow from, like, what, 1987 forward because... Of that incident, and here in this poem, Poffo mentions that Lawler wrote a book. Sure, he did, but the book doesn't mention Randy Savage anywhere in it. And for Poffo to even bring that up, you have to believe that Macho Man truly said that somewhere to Leaping Lanny. Oh yes, I one hundred percent believe that with all my heart. <laughs> Can you believe he never mentioned me not one time? Huh? 
So the promo continues on, though. We come back out of that VTR, that suit of armor, that thing of beauty there. Tux Newman talking about the boy, referring to Sweet Daddy mm. Siki. Uh, he calls him the Double Crosser. Uh, we're channeling oh. a wrestling grenade here. Bret Hart, Bad News Brown, the Double Cross. Well, we got a Double Cross here in uh, Memphis, it seems, too. The Double Crosser, Sweet Daddy Siki. He's going to go down, says Tux, as uh, just ridiculously cheap heat here, calling Siki boy over and over again. And I wrote, if anyone looked anything else but a boy, it was Siki. The guy's been 65 for like 40 years now. Exactly. My goodness. Yeah, he's the last guy on this whole show that you could convince anybody was a boy. <laughs> uh, I mean, I guess in the 80s, we're still we're still using stuff like that for heat. But when you go back and watch it now, you just it's just eye rolling. It's just like, come on, Tux. We know you ain't got much to work with, but surely, surely you can do better than that. It's got to be something better than that. As uh, we go back to the ring now, finally some action. Iron Mike Sharp taking on Tracy, or is that Terry Smothers, according to Dave Brown? No, it's actually Tracy <laughs> Smothers in here. Uh, Lance going to correct him politely without uh, anybody actually realizing it, except for maybe you and me. Uh, but Dave actually going to refer to him as Tracy after that and then go back to Terry by the end of the matchup. I just got a <laughs> kick out of that. But Dave Brown is here, I should mention. Eddie Marlin gone. Dave Brown is back by Lance's side for the rest of the program. Fun little TV match here. Tracy getting control early on with an arm bar that Sharp can't seemingly escape. That is until he lands the big forearm, finally allowing Iron Mike to take over control, taking the match outside, whipping Smothers over the announce desk for absolutely no reason. Mike Sharp loved to do that, it seems. Yes, that was a that become like a staple, almost <laughs> as frequent as the freaking forearm shots was throwing people over the announce desk. And no matter how Very many times odd. I see it. I, it just doesn't work for me. I don't. It doesn't work for Iron Mike Sharp's character. And not the. I mean, if you if you somehow fell into a spot where a guy they're fighting on the floor or something, and you pitch somebody over the desk one time, you know, in the heat of the moment. But just the fact that he threw people out of the ring, went straight over, pitched them over the desk, then brought them right back and put them in the ring. It was just like. I don't know. It was just so mechanical. It was like, all right, then we throw him off the desk, then we bring him back. And then when it's like, it, there was nothing about it that felt natural or necessary. Just strange. Well, you know, what really kills it is how he follows it up, whipping guys over the announce desk, then dragging them back in the ring where he applies a chin lock. And then some <laughs> forearm clubbering here by Iron Mike until he telegraphs a backdrop. Tracy going to leap, leapfrog over, but runs into that loaded forearm band, that big clothesline. From Mike Sharp, going to get the win three and a half minutes. I wish in the in the <laughs> in some of the moments that I spent around Tracy's mothers, and I know you spent way more than I did. <laughs> had I had watched this at the time, and I could be like, "Hey, Tracy, what about the, what about old Mike Sharp throwing you over the announce <laughs> desk and taking her and putting you in a chin lock?" I would have loved to hear what his response to that would have been. Oh man, good guy though, good guy. Something like that, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> He'd spend five minutes burying him, and then go, yeah, good, good guy. Man. That's that was Tracy. I loved it. Oh, he didn't really bury people, but yeah, he kind of told you, no, told you no. the told you the truth, no. anyway. Yeah. <laughs> As uh, we continue on, we get an interview up next from Sweet Daddy Siki, pulling some kids from the crowd to hang out once again this week. No Jerry Lawler there to keep him in line, though. Siki happy. He's not with Tux Newman anymore. Very bland promo, but very well spoken. I wrote the hair don't match the personality at this point. Sweet, sweet Daddy Siki out here with the bleach blonde, the natural Butch Reed type look, of course. Uh, we've seen many guys try to rock this thing over the years. Uh, Siki uh, just out here really just bland overall. Yeah, a buddy of mine who's kind of following along with us watching these shows and then listening to the podcast told me <laughs> told me he thought that Sweet Daddy Siki reminded him of Thunderbolt Patterson on Downers. And I was like, <laughs> hmm, that's an interesting take. I can't say I'll argue it. Well, I, you know, I told you offline, too, I didn't say it go that far. I just said I, when I saw Siki coming in, I expected a Thunderbolt Patterson-like character. And boy, boy, are we at a completely opposite end of that. So I think yeah. that's, a, that's a good analogy there. Thunderbolt on Downers. All right. As, well, I know this. It, it won't leave my head from every time I see him now. That's in the back of my mind. So, <laughs> Well, let's see what he can do in the ring. If his promo wasn't uh, bland enough, it's Sweet Daddy Siki taking on the Invader. And this week, Siki in gear this time, and a unique approach to his wrestling stance here. Arm throws, not arm drags, hip throws, not hip tosses. And then he just kind of stands there and delivers a headbutt to the invader. And even the invader is confused, but he does go down. Siki securing the win. Match goes one minute and 12 seconds. I wrote, boy, that was, well, it was something. 
it, not only does he look like he's 110, but you would swear this being 1985 that Doc Brown dropped him off in a DeLorean <laughs> outside the TV5 studio from, you know, the 1930s to come have this match. Yeah, you know, I'm sitting here, i trying to watch them, and you talk about all the old timers, remember, where the guys would feed them, they would bump into them, and what I'm talking about for those who don't really know a whole lot about how that works in the wrestling business, you get a guy who can't really do much anymore, but you have a young pup in there with them, and they kind of run into him, they feed him, the guy doesn't have to move around a lot, but he looks great, and here, it's not really the invader feeding him, but it's also Seeky not really wanting to do a whole lot, and so uh, this invader, this masked invader character, very confused in there, but he's... He's taking the bumps anyway, and boy, that was an awkward finish, but it was only a minute, and uh, that's not the worst match on the show, actually. <laughs> I don't know if it, what that says about <laughs> this match or the other match, but it says a lot. <laughs> it says a lot without saying much at all, and so we'll see when exactly. we get there. Uh, wait a minute. Who changed up the format? It's your uh, expiration of time, twins. Mark and Brad Batten out here in the middle of the show, taking on the team of the Angel, Frank Morrell, and Dwayne Carpenter. Out of Arkansas. <laughs> That's him. That's the one. I, uh, I immediately looked at the time. I pushed the button on my remote control to look at the time. I was like, oh, we got a short episode this week. The Batons are already in the ring. There must be a ball game or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just noted Dwayne Carpenter out of Arkansas because they said it about three times for whatever yes. reason on commentary. As, you uh, think he was the state representative of Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> As many times as they said it. Maybe his father owned a building somewhere in Arkansas they were going to run. I, I really don't know. But it was very important. They wanted you to know, just like Lance here recently had always wanted you to know, he always wants you to know Constance and Ashley are getting better. He wants you to know that Dwayne Carpenter, he's out of Arkansas. He sure is. But he's not going to start the match off. Instead, it's the Angel heading into the ring against Brad Batten. Not a lot going on, though, in the matchup. The heel side, though, managed to take control as uh, Brad Batten and the Angel collide, and finally, hot tag time to twin brother Mark Batten, who takes it to Carpenter. Nice drop kick, and then followed by a double drop kick. A lot of moves being used here. Batten twins got to get the win in just three minutes and 49 seconds. I wrote, and I'm not positive on this, but I said, is this their first win of the year on TV for the Batten twins? If it's not, I can't name when the other one was. It certainly felt like it to me, and you could almost feel like the intensity of how excited they were to be winning. Like I said, got that hot tag, come in, double drop kick. Like, it's just like, oh my God, we're winning. We're, we're, let's, let's, let's finish the match before they call an audible and change their mind. Yeah, double drop kick. Rock and roll, brother. The Batten Twins going over. And for good reason, we're going to find out why here in just a few moments as we see the Angel leave his partner in disgust doing the job. <sighs> Jimmy Ward would be proud of Frank Morrell. That bastard. How dare you leave? Miss, <laughs> you leave that man from Arkansas in the ring like that. <laughs> Headed back to Arkansas is Mr. Dwayne Carpenter. We'll have to wait and see if he pops up again as we go off to a music video of Constance and Ashley set to the tune of The Heat Is On. Oh, I love that song. I, I swear they just toss darts at a stack of 80s cassette tapes. Yeah, yeah, that'll be the one we play this week. Constance and Ashley, the heat is on. <laughs> Every time I'm, an, an odd song starts playing, I hear your voice <laughs> doing Lance saying what you just said. Oh, I love that. Oh, I love that song. <laughs> it's a real toe tapper. Do they have that on 8-track? <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lance. Oh, man. So we saw the Batten score a win. Then we see a great music video here of Constance and Ashley. And when we come back to Lance Russell... He's standing with all four men, Brad and Mark Batten, Tim Ashley, Steve Constance, all standing out here. Boy, talk about squeezing shit in, Gene. Two separate teams plugging two separate matches at the same time. This felt so weird. It felt exactly what you said. It was just like whoever was putting the show together was like, look, nobody gives a shit about either of these teams. Throw them all out there together. Just plug right. it all at once. Like. Who when cares? when I saw this initially, I thought, "Oh, Battle of the Baby Faces coming up at the Coliseum, gonna may the Whoa. best man win." Kind of promo. Well, thank God. But I'm just saying that was my first thought when yeah. I see both oh, teams yeah, out definitely. here at the same time. Maybe an eight man tag, even that would have been my second thought. Nope. Instead, the Battens have the PYTs at the Mid South Coliseum tomorrow, and Lance says the PYTs beat Constance and Ashley last week in about 18 minutes and 47 seconds. 
first of all, Gene, I love that Lance is so exact, but B, 19 minutes of the PYTs versus Ooh. Constance and Ashley. Man, Coco had to be pissed by the end of that one. You know it. And then, yeah, the whole the whole plot of this is Constance and Ashley have been schooling the Battens <laughs> on how to wrestle the PYTs, which that conversation should have just been, hey, don't let Coco drop you on your freaking head. You'll be fine. <laughs> I was going to say, who are Constance and Ashley to give the Battens any, uh, any clue as to how to defeat the PYTs when they lost to the PYTs last week? But that's the story yeah. we're telling here. And I guess you can tie that into why the Battens scored a win here on TV this week. They had to be credible walking into the matchup with Coco Ware and Norvell Austin tomorrow, the special Sunday edition of the Mid-South Coliseum show. As uh, we continue on, speaking of the PYTs, it is tag team action up next with Tux Newman in their corner. Coco Ware, Norvell Austin taking on the team of David Wilson and Gary Jackson. Get the fuck out of here. Gary Jackson, built here from Bad Street, USA. I wrote, what? Uh, I wonder if he ever what lived next. What the hell next... was that about? I wonder if he lived near old lady McDuffie. She done gave the cops a call, you know. Yeah, I mean, when he said that, I, I was don't like, know. what the hell is that? Why would they let this jobber say he's from Bat Street? <laughs> I mean, is that their... Was that, that a rib on him? I, I don't really know. Yeah, was it a rib on him, or was it their way of like shitting on the Freebirds? Because, like, yeah, we'll let him use your gimmick. I don't know. <laughs> there, that, was, there was a gimmick to Gary Jackson? I, I didn't mean, notice. I was just... I was distracted through this whole match of just going, why would they let the jobber say he's from Bad Street? Why would he want to be called from Bad Street, USA? <laughs> now, you say you say the, the angel walking out would have made Jamie Ward happy, but you let Jamie know some jobber on Memphis is claiming Bad Street, USA, and I uh, got a feeling he's yeah. going to be pretty fired up. Yeah, well, it was fun seeing Gary Jackson out here, who, truth be told, I used to refer to him as Little Coco for years when he would do jobs on <laughs> WWF TV. But to give you guys an idea of how small Jackson is, I see him standing across the ring from Coco, and even Jackson might be a little bigger than Ware, which shocked me a little bit. So uh, no more little Coco, I guess, right? Yeah, and I mean, I've always assumed that that's why Coco was such an angry little man mm -hmm. in, in these days and <laughs> throughout his career is just making up for you know the, the whole Napoleon complex thing, because man... Uh, you know, I I was around him on some shows in Mississippi years and years later, and just watched him just beat the brakes off of these young guys. I had no, idea. and they were like trainees of his. He would bring them to the show and then just beat the holy hell out of them, and then they had to get in the car and ride back to Memphis with him. Well, and, and drive <laughs> too, I'm sure, right? Oh yes, definitely. They carried his bags to the car and then and then drove him back to Memphis. Paid for the beer. Arm. Woof. Uh, well, you know what? Coco may be the smallest man in this matchup, but that doesn't keep him from eating the uh, opponents up here. Coco mauling Gary Jackson, grinding his face into the mat. I'll teach you to look like me. As we're <laughs> dropping his knees directly on Gary's head. I wrote, geez, what did these guys do to Coco? Finally, <sighs> David Wilson going to tag in, and immediately he too gets slaughtered as beware, or where at this point, Brain buster of death on poor David Wilson. The dude literally stays folded as he lands. I wrote LOL. Man, I mean, again, this is 1985, and I just absolutely draw up and cringe watching Coco drop these guys on their head. It's, it's, it's so dangerous. Like, I don't understand how they're just letting him go out there and do this to these people. Like, it's crazy how unsafe it is. But this, like, what you were talking about, those knees he was dropping on that guy. Yeah. It's like, Coco. Well, dude, at one point he problem, was trying to give man. his give him a mat burn, rubbing his face. I mean, legitimately rubbing his face across the mat for absolutely. I mean, this is how the match started, right? He gets him down and just starts dragging his face across the mat. Yeah, it's not like he had a chance to blow a spot, and now we're you know we're taking it out on him. This, right. this, this is how we came out of the gate, unless unless the guy made him mad, you know, in the back, or like I said, it might just be the fact the guy. <clears throat> how dare you look like me and be a little bit larger, you know? But. <laughs> Well, I tell you, somebody made made that joke and, and screwed Jerry ja Gary Jackson. Hey, we hate Coco. We might just plug him in as the new member of the PYTs. And, you know, that's all it took, maybe. I, I don't know. Maybe they wrote the 
<laughs> wrote, wrote the end of Gary Jackson here. I didn't even know he came through Memphis at this point in time, so it was kind of cool to see him. But you go back to that brain buster and uh, David Wilson coming down on his head and his legs just kind of fold up and he's just kind of hanging there upside down on the mat. So many masters of the brain buster over time. Of course, Carl Cox, Dick Murdoch, they made it look great, but it was very controlled for the most part anyway. But here with Coco, like you said, man, he's just dumping these guys on their head. It's great to watch as a fan, but again, cringeworthy at the same time. Oh, yeah. It, it, these Coco matches, I forgot just how uncomfortable it is to watch some of these matches. Uh, just thinking of it from the poor jobber's perspective. <laughs> well, we're going to dump Wilson on his head with that brain buster and then tag in Norville Austin, who simply struts <laughs> over and kneels on the chest of the near-dead Wilson to get the one, two, three. Great finish there from Norvell. Going to give the PYTs the win. Match goes two minutes and 44 seconds. And then post-match, Coco stomping the men again after the bout. I guess if your name is David, you should steer clear of Memphis TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's some other guys named David turning around and heading the other direction if they uh -huh. see this in the, the match from Savage last week. <laughs> Oh, man, at least it's not the same guy. Not that I would expect uh, David Johnson to have returned so quickly after the, the mauling last week by the Macho Man. But I don't know that we're going to see David Wilson back immediately either. We'll have to see what happens with that. But right now, guys, we're going to take a quick WrestleCopia timeout, and we're going to pick back up with more great championship wrestling from the CWA on the other side. Hey everybody, Gene Jackson here inviting you to check out the Retro Wrestling Review, where each week I'm joined by some great co-hosts who help me review classic episodes of USWA Championship Wrestling, and right now we are doing week-by-week -week reviews of 1993. But we don't just do reviews, sometimes we get a chance to interview some of the people who were there and lived it, plus do watch-alongs. It's a lot of fun, so check out new episodes that drop every Wednesday at WrestleCopia.com. And to find links to everything associated to the podcast, you can go to USWAPodcast.com. Hey guys, Ray Russell here, curator of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network, inviting you guys to listen to many of the programs here as part of the WrestleCopia brand, including, but not limited to, the Wrestling Memory Grenade, currently covering the 1988 and the WWF project. You can also listen to the Regional Wrestling Podcast, where we talk the territories, whether it's Jamie Ward with Georgia 81, Roman Gomez with the UWF in 1986, or Gene Jackson covering Memphis in 85. Three projects going on right now over there at Regional Wrestling. You can also listen to the Wrestling Stoop with the legend himself, Bob Roop. Bob goes back in time each and every week, covering not just his career, but countless stories and interactions with hundreds of wrestling names spanning his two decades in the business. But that's not all. You can also check out the Puro Wrestling Academy with the professor of Puro Resu, Mr. Dan Ginnity. Dan and I go back in time and cover the history of Japanese professional wrestling in the English language. And you can listen to all of those shows and more, all part of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network, located over at WrestleCopia.com. That's WrestleCopia.com and anywhere your podcast streaming needs are met. From Apple to Spotify, Pocket Cast and beyond. And while you're at it, why not subscribe to our social media guys for all the latest goings on here at the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. Plus, I'm constantly adding old school video clips and pictures from throughout wrestling history, you can follow us over on X, formerly Twitter, at Wrestling Grenade. That's at R A S S L I N Grenade. Also, follow and like me, Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And why not subscribe to YouTube.com slash Wrestling Grenade? And of course, now would be a fantastic time to become a WrestleCopia patron. I'm talking about that $5 all access tier over at Patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. That address again, patreon.com slash WrestleCopia, where you get so many gifts for just five bucks, including all of my insanely detailed show notes for every episode of The Grenade Show, Regional Wrestling, and the Monday Warfare Podcast. You also get early access to a lot of the podcasts here on the WrestleCopia brand, where you can listen days and sometimes as much as a week earlier than the rest of the listeners. We also offer remastered versions of the earliest episodes of The Grenade Show 
covering the 1989 NWA project, includes enhanced sound quality, plus new content and conversation never heard before. But that's still not all, guys. You also get at least a dozen digital downloads for your viewing and reading pleasure each and every month, plus random bonus video drops, and of course, the Patreon-exclusive Watch Along series, covering many past WWF and WCW events. And if that's not all, Videocasts, also now a part of Patreon. And for those who like all of their podcasts in one nice, neat little pile, the WrestleCopia Patreon also offers a Patreon-exclusive Spotify account. You can actually go over to your Spotify with your WrestleCopia Patreon credentials. Instead of listening or downloading directly from Patreon, you can go over to Spotify and listen to all the latest shows, including all of the early releases. And you get all of that and so much more for just $5. No subscription. Cancel any time. Give it a try for a month, guys. I think you'll like the content that I offer, and every penny of it goes right back here into paying the bills. So if you're looking to support that next up-and-coming podcast brand, please consider making it WrestleCopia. Help me pay some of the bills to keep the WrestleCopia podcast network and all of the great shows here up and running for the months and the years to come. Hey, it's Bob Smith, and guess what? The Outdated Wrestling Hour is now part of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network. But hey, no fear, you're still going to hear the unique guests, comedy, music, authors, journalists, funny people. Who knows who's going to end up on the Outdated Wrestling Hour. Remember, it's all new and all old. So check it out in the WrestleCopia Podcast Network and wherever you get your podcasts. Listen, if you know what's good for you. All right, guys, welcome back to the program. Closing out the month of March here in 1985, Ray Russell here alongside Gene Jackson as we continue on with the program. What a program it's been thus far. Lots of uh, crazy shenanigans going on, and then even the Batten Twins and Constance and Ashley out here cutting a promo. I don't know what the hell's going on here this week. Yeah, it's uh, it's quite the episode this week. <clears throat> been some rough stuff in the ring, and then uh, any time that... Ashley and the constant the constants and Ashley are anywhere near a microphone. You, you know, it's it's going to be a bad day. Yeah, and then hey, Lanny Poffo in a suit of armor in front of a castle. Who, who knew? <laughs> I mean, who knew what we were going to see walking into this episode? I mean, and the best maybe is yet to come. The Macho Man going to be back out here before too long. But first, nope, here he is. He's coming out right now with Tux Newman for another interview. This time talking Stephanie and Stan Arena. Ah, creative tucks there. What great names for the fabulous ones. Stephanie for Steve, obviously, and Stan Arena. I don't know who that would be for. Well, you know, you'd expect nothing less than super creativity from the tux man. <laughs> the tux man cometh. And so do the Poffo Express, Randy Savage and Lanny Poffo, now coming after the fabulous ones and their southern tag team titles. Macho then holding up a glittery poster. Keep that in mind, guys. Great stenciling I wrote here, by the way. It reads, tell Jackie Fargo the king is dead. Savage says he is now the king of Memphis, the king of the South. So says the macho man. I really hope Lanny was the one that made that poster. I would, I would hate to know that Mach was, uh, he, he would have to get straight A's in art class if he made that. I, you know, I'm telling you, man, based on how many signs Randy Savage has come in here with over the, the past several months, year, whatever it's been, I, I truly feel like uh, Mach has had some, uh, spent some time in the car making a few posters. I mean, I assume he has some material. He has like glitter and stuff left over <clears throat> from when he's making his own, uh, <laughs> you know, ring attire, his entrance gear and stuff. And he's like, let's make a poster. Oh, I got a book of this shit left. <laughs> <laughs> well, we get to see them in action here, talking about the Macho Man teaming with Brother Leaping Lanny Poffo, Tux Newman in their corner. They're going to be taking on the interesting team of Jerry Oski and Billy Travis as Macho Man going to rip up a copy of Jerry Lawler's book before the match. And then a little flippity do by Poffo during the intro here as Oski with a really nice gorilla press throw on Leaping Lanny early on and a drop kick and a send Poffo over the top rope to the outside. See guys, Lanny willing to work with these two. Savage, maybe not so much. Yeah, I was just thinking when that happened, I'm thinking Savage out there like, oh, you're going to pay for that, buddy. Tag me in. Tag me in. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Oski going to suplex Lanny back inside the ring, tag to Billy Travis, 
who delivers a pump splash out of the corner, Bob Orton style, some people call it the Vader bomb here, by Billy Travis, and then a knee drop by Billy as well, but Travis going to miss Lanny Poffo's blind tag behind him, tag out to the Macho Man, and look out Billy Savage in immediately, tossing Travis outside for that flying double axe handle off the top rope, and then back in the ring for the diving elbow. Going to end this one quickly, 1 minute and 51 seconds. And a little backflip from Leaping Lanny in celebration. <laughs> well, at least, I ain't going to say it was painless, but at least it was quick. Quick and over with Randy Savage scoring the win there for his team. Not going to fuck around. Lanny Poffo trying to give the guy some uh, some offense here. Savage having none of it. That's why the, he's the Southern champion, guys. And, you know, as I was watching this match, I, was, I started thinking, I was just daydreaming here watching Lanny Poffo in the ring. I was like, I would have loved to have seen Poffo out here throwing Frisbees in a studio this size because they would have been bouncing off the wall, hitting people in the face. Would have been a great heel deal. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and then somebody would have kept one out that went out in the crowd that would have got whizzed in there two matches uh, later when one of the heels came in. When Constance and Ashley are working. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been worth it. So worth it. Boy, I tell you what, if you'd have pinged a Frisbee off the side of Coco's head, somebody would have died. Oh, man, yeah. <laughs> you got that right. As uh, Up next on the show, we get a quick rundown of the upcoming Mid-South Coliseum card, again taking place tomorrow, Sunday night, at the Mid-South Coliseum there. We hear from the fabulous ones up next. Going to cut a promo here. The Fabs have Savage and Poffo. The Southern Tag Team titles on the line at the Mid-South Coliseum as Kern continuously refers to Tux Newman as Tex. (laughs) That's so weird because there's nothing about him that screams Tex. I was thinking the same thing. Just to say his name wrong. (laughs) Especially after Stan Landis repeatedly call him Tuxedo Newman. Steve Kern just doesn't give a shit here. Tex Newman says he puts, Newman puts his hands up his men's shirt. I guess referring to him as a puppet, but with Lanny Poffo involved. I can only think about Every time we try to wrestle either single or tag team, it ends up in a gangbang. <laughs> well, I didn't think about that watching it, but it'll be in my head now. <laughs> well, Steve Kern basi- basically, <laughs> you're very welcome. <laughs> Steve, Steve Kern basically calling Tex or Tux's men puppets here. We also learned that after taking a call in the Bahamas and flying all the way back to Memphis, we learned that Jackie Fargo has better things to do, Gene, than deal with Tux Newman and his boys. Apparently, though, the Fabs don't have anything better to do, so they're here to wrestle. Uh, And uh, this is kind of interesting. Steve Kern says, we don't need Jackie Fargo. I don't know what really is going on there with all of that. Yeah, it was a weird thing to even bring up when he's not going to be involved and then for him just to say, we don't need we don't need Fargo. Yeah, I don't know what's going on there, but there's definitely a reason for that whole thing to even be said. But I don't blame Jackie. I, I don't have time for Tux Newman either. So. <laughs> well, we have to make time for him here on Regional <laughs> Wrestling. And we've got a couple of great lines here coming up in just a moment by Stan Lane. But before we get to those, uh, this one's not, not so good. They say that Tux Newman will be relegated to the name Leisure Newman when they're done. A downgrade in suits. I wrote, that was pretty lame. Yeah, throw that one back. <laughs> but what is not lame, Stan Lane gets on the microphone, Gene. He says, Hey, I want to know what kind of guy calls himself a macho man while he sits out there in his car all day making glitter posters. I wrote, wow, Stan clearly did not fear Randy Savage. Stan Lane is the absolute MVP of this episode for that (laughs) one line alone. I popped and rewound that twice listening to that. I was like, holy, like, man, Stan Lane is on fire here lately. Yeah, it was great because you didn't see it coming. You weren't expecting it. And I was just kind of waiting to get through this promo, write some generic comments, and and move along to the next match. Stan says that, and then I had to rewind it to listen to it again. Not because, not just because it was funny, but at the same time because I wanted to make sure I wrote down exactly what he said. Because what a great delivery. What kind of man, anyway, calls himself a macho man while he sits out there all day in his car making glitter posters? I mean, wow. Talk oh, about God. a shoot. <clears throat> you know, in WWF over the years, they, they cut to a camera in the back watching somebody watching a monitor. I would have gave any amount of money <laughs> to have a camera on Savage when Lane said that line. Oh, man, he had to be livid. I want to see if Randy Savage is still here in the studio. That's what I want to see here as we continue <laughs> on with this episode. As Stan going to finish up this promo here, he says, And you, Lenny Poffo, out here doing cartwheels and backflips, auditioning for a Circus of the Stars. Stan Lane on a roll once again this week. 
and when he started that line, I didn't know where that one was going to end Me up going. Either. I mean, it was a good line, but I mean, it, it could have went a hundred. So places. many that different places. I was expecting. <laughs> yeah, my imagination was taking it much further <laughs> off course, but yes. it, it was it was okay for what it was. But it certainly didn't top the Macho Man comment. And I, yeah, obviously there were many ways he could have taken that that would have been much more entertaining. <laughs> but we'll, we'll just leave that there as the Fabs head to the ring to take on the team of Tom Branch. The other half of the Renesto Express now here. We've seen Speedy Tall Tree. Tom Branch has worked the house shows, but I do believe this is Branch's debut on TV, if I if I remember correctly. So Tom Branch, the other son of Tom Renesto, the Booker. Yeah, uh, the Booker's boys are here, and you know I I heard that name Tom Branch a lot over the years, but I couldn't remember ever seeing him. And this isn't who I had been picturing the times we've talked about him in the past here. So good to finally put a face with the name. Well, it is the Fabulous Ones taking on Tom Branch and Jerry or Terry Pack. I don't think it really matters, but he looks like a hippie Bob Remus. A picture a early young Sergeant Slaughter with the long hair look. This guy looks almost identical to him. Good call. Wow. Yeah, you nailed that one. That's dead on. So match gets going. A backdrop and body slam basics by the Fabs until Pack tries to go into business for himself. And for that... He eats a backdrop driver by Steve Kern. You ain't getting no offense on me, son. And then it's a driving clothesline. Stan Lane taking Pack down into the mat as Kern going to toss Branch out of the ring. Fabulous ones going over two minutes, 25 seconds. Well, a rare occasion here. We're seeing the Fabs in action in the studio. So that's fun. And, you know, clearly, you know, Jerry Lawler's out injured. I don't really know if there was a particular reason why we needed to get Lawler out of here other than just to heat up this angle, but who better to put Savage in the ring with to try to draw if you ain't going to have Lawler there than the fabulous ones? Oh, yeah, absolutely. When you look at the roster right now, top to bottom, that's the perfect po- spot. I don't know if Lanny's the, the greatest partner in this uh, no. position, but I don't think Randy's going to agree to team with anyone else. As uh, we go back to the ring, more tag team action up next, Steve Constance and Tim Ashley. We don't see them a whole lot here on TV. And for good reason, as you're about to find out, they're going to take on the team of Mr. Wrestling. That's Tommy Gilbert and Benny Trailer. Hey, where's Jerry Garman when you need him? Yeah, poor Tommy. I I figure they were waiting and they pushed this back down the line of the show as far as they could. And then when Garman didn't show up, they're like, sorry, Tommy, you're going to have to go out there and tag this (laughs) squash match here. Uh, (laughs) Nobody knows it's you. And he's like, you bullshit. (laughs) You told them said my name every week until now. Well, that's, that's another thing I noticed here this week and last is uh, the action gets going. Tim Ashley telegraphing a backdrop early on. Mr. Wrestling going to take over as they've now completely dropped the whole Tommy Gilbert routine because I don't think they give a shit anymore, Gene. No, he's just kind of left over. Clearly Tom Ernesto, when he came in, had no intention of doing anything uh, meaningful with the Gilberts. And right. they quickly, to see how, you know, Eddie went from being, you know, Eddie's army and the top of the card to stripping of his of his gimmick, his, his stable, and pushing him down the card. And Tommy's just kind of left over here, it seems. Well, we know Eddie's going to go off to do some uh, big things for the Mid-South Territory, the UWF, in the uh, months and then years to come. And, of course, Tommy Gilbert, not going to be too far off from uh, popping up as a referee over there and doing a damn fine job of it in 1986, UWF, I might add. But right now, Tommy Gilbert's still under the hood here. And I think at this point, he probably walked over to Lance and Dave and begged them, guys, please don't remind him who I don't want anybody to remember who I am right now. <laughs> Lance is like, all right, Tommy. All right, Tommy. They know it's you. All right. The match continues on. Steve Constance going to tag in. He has one move to do in this match, Gene, and completely fucks it up. Just a power slam on Benny Trailer. Awful from bo- both ends on that move from both of those guys. I wrote terrible match that only goes one minute and two seconds. How does someone regress this much? I don't know. You're like me. You've watched a ton of wrestling in your day. Have you ever seen a simple power slam botched quite that bad? No, I don't know exactly what went wrong there. I kind of wanted to blame Benny when I went back and watched it a second time. I was like, well, he didn't really get up and over for it. He wasn't in the right position to take the move. But at the same time, a guy that size, a guy with that kind of strength, uh, talking about uh, Ash or Constance here, should have had no problem taking a guy the size of Benny Trailer over for a simple power slam. It was, it wasn't good. I'll put it that much. I, I wrote terrible here in my notes. 
Jerry Oski would have got him over, I think. But well, that would have that would have been true. He would have been out of breath doing it, but he would have got it done. No, he would have been blown completely <laughs> up, but he would have flipped him over and power slammed him properly. Well, ready with, or not, with Jerry the King Lawler out, we learned that Lance Russell gonna host the Jerry Lawler Show tomorrow. Summon a gun. Unfortunately, we're missing that episode, Gene. I really wanted to catch that one. As uh, the special guest going to be Sweet Daddy Siki and the National High School Pom Pom Champs. <laughs> Boy, I bet Jerry Lawler upset he missed that one. Oh, I got a, I got a feeling whoever books his show is going to do that as a favor. Made sure he wasn't there. I was going to say one. they like, were just uh, waiting for his to get own them good, on. We're gonna. <laughs> Just hang on, girls. Sound good. We're going to book that the week he's not here, okay? They kept pushing the girls oh, wow. back until, oh, we see, we see the opening, now the opportunity. Let's give them their shot here on national TV, or on local TV anyway, here in the Memphis uh, area. National High School Pond Pom Champs. Jerry Lawler, nowhere in sight. Ah, uh, Lance chatting with big uh, sweet daddy Seeky. Man, I hate we missed that. I do, too. Man, that would have been some on a gun. That would have been a good one. As uh, we go back to the ring, going to see Dirty Dutch Mantell taking on from the Ozark Mountains, it's J.R. Hogg. Unfortunately, not a whole lot here. As a uh, Hogg eventually getting in some cheap shots, but J.R. missing a corner charge and Dutch going to drop a running elbow. Very basic, but he gets the win. One minute and 43 seconds. Well, you know, we talk about how quickly Sweet Daddy Seeky came in and turned. Boy, how quickly the Hogs came in and just fell down the card to yeah. this one hog that's left over is just a pretty much a jobber now. Yeah. And it's, you know, like I said, I had high hopes for them. They were kind of impressive for, you know, guys that really hadn't made the rounds outside of a little bit in central States and working up in Indianapolis, places like that, kind of the lower end territories by the 1980s, but the hogs were okay. Certainly by Memphis standards as a tag, look at some of the teams we've had to witness so far here in 85. I was, I was totally on board to see what they could do, but like you said, one of them disappears, and the other one has been relegated to job guy status already. Very unfortunate. And I assume that they were a Renesto hire, but I mean, which I mean, I guess if one guy disappears for whatever reason, I guess your plans are kind of shot. You just kind of job the other guy until he leaves. But <clears throat> I expected them to come in with a big, with a big push, and it fell apart quickly. Well, another thing that fell apart quickly was Eddie's Army as Hot Stuff, formerly a General Eddie Gilbert out here up next, taking on Speedy Tall Tree. Wow, four matches in a row, no promos. Very odd here as uh, everything Eddie going to ex execute early in the matchup, Tall Tree going to come back and do it twice. Eddie with an arm drag, Speedy with two. Eddie with a drop kick, Tall Tree with two of those as well. But the crowd, not really reacting to it. As Gilbert then busting out a Fargo strut, and a fucking hot shot proper. Talking about dropping that guy, Speedy Tall Tree, across the top rope, hot shot out of nowhere. And that's when I wrote in my notes, and I'm going to ask Eugene, put you on the spot. Do you know, or does anyone out there know, when Eddie started using the actual hot shot we would come to know as his hot shot finisher? I had forgot that he was even using the DDT at this time and calling it the hot shot. Mm -hmm. uh, but I'm pretty sure he was using it in 86. So it's got to be somewhere in that crossover of him going back to, to Mid-South and then eventually becoming UWF. But as far as pinning down the exact time frame, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't say, honestly. Well, this is the first time I've noticed him use it here in Memphis. And I'm not saying this is the first time he ever tried the move, but I'm wondering, is this the first time he's actually tried to, you know, use the move on TV as one of his uh, arsenal? So uh, it's the first time I've noticed it in the three months we've been watching it. No, oh, definitely. It definitely stood out to me. Watching the match, like, hey, there's the actual hot shot. Or at least what we come to know is the hot shot. I was like, hmm, that's fun. Well, well he sure wasn't uh -oh. using it in the WWF, but I'm curious anybody out there who has kept up with Eddie Gilbert's career, if they know if they've seen him use this prior to this Memphis run, because this may be the infancy of the what would come to be known as the actual hot shot. We know, Ray. I know a guy who might happen to know. I'll have to ask him. The action going to continue because that's not his finisher just yet. Speedy Tall Tree with a brief comeback misses a middle rope reverse crossbody, however, and Eddie with the 1985 version of the hot shot, aka, as you said, Gene, the DDT, going to score the win three minutes and 21 seconds. Hot stuff, Eddie Gilbert. So by the time he's going back to Mid South, Jake is prime DDT time, right? So yep. he would have had to start transitioning to a different finish at this point right 
So yeah, I'm guessing there. maybe he experimented with the hot shot. They, well, it sounds weird to say it since he's calling the DDT that, but what we know is the hot shot had started experimenting here in Memphis. He gets over there like, hey, you can't do the DDT. Jake pretty much owns that. It's like, I got this other move we can use. Well, it worked for several years to come, but I just it stood out to me. I hadn't seen him do it in the entire time we've been watching it, and boom, wham, out of nowhere, he lands it, but it's not the finish. The hot shot here in 1985 Memphis is simply, as you said, the DDT, and it does get the win, as finally, after four matches in a row, very un-Memphis-like, we finally get another interview, Dutch Mantel stopping by with Lance Russell, as Dutch going to have Eddie Gilbert in the ring tomorrow at the Mid-South Coliseum. Mantell has words also here for Tux Newman. Tux Newman trying to court Dutch, not going to happen. Mantell then tries to refer to Eddie as a wolf in sheep's clothing, which doesn't really make sense because we already know Eddie's a heel. I think what Dutch meant to do was call Eddie a follower, a sheep, but again, ignoring the whole army thing because Eddie was the leader. But Dutch wasn't here for that, Gene, so I guess I don't blame him. Yeah, man, Eddie, I mean, Eddie, uh, Dutch is quite the wordsmith throughout his career and just Mm -hmm. a master promo guy, master storyteller. So, yeah, I noticed that watching this. I thought, man, very rare for Dutch to just completely blow a a promo and and not make sense with his analogy. So uh, they're few and far between. So good catch. You've seen a lot of Dutch Mantel over your career, over your life. I've seen a lot of Dutch Mantel growing up, watching him in the ring from various uh, promotions and on videotapes and things. Have you ever seen Dutch more disenchanted than he is here in this run? I mean, his promos is kind of there. His matches, he's they're going less than two minutes. It's basically a body slam and an elbow drop for the finish. I, it's just something about this, and I don't want to go back to Jerry Lawler. We've already talked about that, where he kind of felt disenchanted for the last several months here in the territory, but I'm just not like feeling the vibes that Dutch usually gives off the heat that Dutch normally gives off when he arrives in the territory. No, he is definitely going through the motions. And I think this is probably just a, a stop off to somewhere, you know, his next place he's headed. I think he kind of knows that he's not going to be around real long, or maybe he's not intending to be because you're exactly right. He's not invested in these matches. He's not invested in these promos. And this promo is a prime example of that because that's just not something you see Dutch do. Just completely screw up an analogy and, and say something in a promo that if you think about it for even a brief second, it, it makes no sense. Yeah, I don't think, you know, and Dutch has always been a great promo. Everybody knows that. And I don't even want to call it a bad promo because it wasn't like it was incoherent. It just didn't make sense to the context of what was going on out here. And I I really don't think he thought it through until he got up there and started talking to Lance. Uh, But it's enough to bring Eddie Gilbert back out, though. He's out to confront a Dutch Mantel here. Eddie says, I'm no sheep. And the only thing that Eddie and Tux Newman have in common is that they both love Eddie Gilbert. I love that line. (laughs) As a Dutch Mantel, though, not very impressed with hot stuff. And Dutch going to make the mistake to turn his back on Eddie Gilbert. Is Gilbert then going to pull his hand out of his shirt and blast Dutch in the back of the head with a pair of brass knuckles. I guess Dutch didn't notice that he had his hands wrapped in his shirt the whole time. Yeah, see, another example of Dutch just uh, (laughs) not being with it, man. Uh, Any other time you tease me with the potential of an Eddie Gilbert-Dutch Mantell feud, and I'm there for it, Mm -hmm. Uh, so much potential there, but with... With Dutch just kind of phoning it in, just kind of just he's just kind of here and seeing clearly that Ernesto has no significant plans for Eddie, and you got to know knowing Eddie Gilbert that he is working his way out of here. Yeah, uh, you just know this has no legs at all. Eddie, so young, so talented. He, you know, he always wanted to be a Booker. He's gonna, you know, see that come to fruition in '87 UWF, but at the same time. I, you know, I go back here and I look and I see Dutch Mantell, who's not maybe not as hungry as Eddie Gilbert. So Eddie, he's still doing you know the best he can out here. But it's like you said, I don't think Dutch Mantell's very long for this territory. And uh, spoiler alert, guys, we're going to have more on that on the next episode of the Memphis Regional Wrestling. Uh, maybe Dutch going to take somebody with him when he leaves the territory. Stay tuned for that. As uh, we come back from break, though, closing segment, Dutch Mantell back up on his feet has a final word for one hot stuff, Eddie Gilbert, who made the simple mistake that he didn't finish the job. Dutch Mantell back up, and he's going to take Eddie Gilbert out tomorrow at the Mid-South Coliseum. There we go. The match is official, so we'll see how that plays out. 
Well, you know, it's really unfortunate. We have a little angle, a five-second angle. It's all it takes. Eddie Gilbert hits Dutch in the back of the head, pair of brass knuckles. We go into a commercial break. We come back. Dutch should be hot. He's not really happy about it, and he's ready for the matchup. So insta-feud, I guess you could say. But at the same time, you have two talents that level. I don't care if they're not your main eventers in your mind. Why aren't you utilizing them better than this? I got to question Tom Ernesto wanting to bring in Sweet Daddy Seeky and Cyclops. Meanwhile, Cyclops still coming, guys. Stay tuned. But meanwhile, <laughs> at the same time, on the other end, this. This is what we get with Mantell and Gilbert. I can only assume Cyclops has trouble reading maps, and that's why he's having such a problem. <laughs> he's making got it only one eye. <laughs> Imagine if that contact falls out, he's screwed. Exactly. Well, TV show this week, very light on the promos in general. And I noticed I didn't see the Macho Man reappear after that Fabulous Ones promo. So that's why it may have been safer, Stan Lane, to cut that interview. But uh, really, really weird way to close the show. I don't know if I've ever seen that in the history of Memphis. Four straight segments with four straight matches. No interviews before or after. Yeah, very un Memphis like to say the least. But maybe that's what Ernesto, he, he's here to switch things up and freshen things up and maybe he thinks that's the first step in doing so well last week on the show or last time here on regional wrestling memphis 85 we talked about jerry lawler disappearing from the house shows after the mid-south coliseum card of course we come to find out he was taken out on a stretcher shipped off to the hospital medical facility pal uh now we, we talked about that last time but it continues here and we see here on tv the reason for jerry lawler's absence But in reality, the King was off to Hawaii to work some shows. And according to Steve Crawford, once again, Steve Crawford wrote in one more time. He says that Jeff Walton, a.k.a. Tux Newman, said in an interview with Scott Bowden that Booker at the time, Tom Renesto, got Jerry Lawler to agree to leave for a little bit because Renesto felt the King had become somewhat stale. Now, I don't know that Lawler could get stale, Gene, to the fans of Memphis, but He sure as hell was acting stale on TV, that's for sure. Yeah, I mean, he may not have been stale to the fans, but I think he was burnt out, and he wasn't enjoying himself. So he definitely needed to be away. I don't don't know that you really could afford to have him be away from a fan's perspective, but he certainly needed to to get out, and what better place to go than freaking Hawaii if you need to recharge your batteries and uh, freshen up from being stale, that's for sure. Yeah, and obviously the boys love to go over there because they could write it off as a business expense and then enjoy the the beautiful Hawaiian sun, the beaches, and, and everything that goes along with it. And they you know, work a couple matches, and that's what Jerry Lawler does. He won the Polynesian heavyweight title back in January, goes back here in March, and drops the belt back and works there for at least a little bit. Uh, actually, spoiler alert, guys, Lawler going to be gone for about a month. He's going to be off TV for about four weeks here. And as you said, it's going to build up the feud for Lawler's return versus Randy Savage. Let's hope Savage is still here by that point. Uh, But they didn't bring any top name talent in the meantime. So with Jerry Lawler out, we had no real baby faces to challenge the Macho Man during this big push. And uh, Steve Crawford also said, you got to remember that Tom Ernesto was also the booker during some of the last days of the Ghoulis territory in Nashville. Eek, how did he get a job here? And so, no kidding. Um, <laughs> it's a fun fact. It was on this this time in Hawaii that Lawler met a young manager named Downtown Bruno that he took oh. a liking to, and uh, I'm sure thinking in the back of his mind, you know, when we get this Tux Newman guy out of here eventually, uh, there might be a spot for you. And he told Bruno, he said that you know Jimmy Hart's gone, and we're trying out some other managers, but so far things aren't working out. And I may eventually have a spot for you. And as Bruno tells it, you know, two or three few months later, he gets that phone call, and Lawler brings him in on into '86. By the time it actually finally happens, but right. this is the tour where he met Bruno because Rocky Johnson had found Bruno and kansas city and took him off to hawaii and uh that goes you know pretty far back to where you talk about the friendship between bruno and the rock dwayne johnson of course it goes pretty far back and it all starts really with uh bruno being found by rocky johnson yeah it all ties together well uh, i mean you, you look back and you think about tom ernesto and then we learn that he was the final booker in the dying days of the ghoulis territory in nashville uh, a, how does he get the job here at Memphis? Oh, we, we need you. And that was, you know, a while back, by the way, I, I mind you guys. 
And then we need you. You're going to turn things around for us, Tom Ernesto. And I'm not mocking him, his overall ability as a booker, because he did some fantastic jobs in the 1970s. One of the top heels of all time. He was uh, the Bolo number two and the original assassin number one. Jody Hamilton slides in as assassin two. And then when Ernesto retires, Jody Hamilton becomes assassin one. But Tom Ernesto, the original assassin, here he is promoting. And we're going to see him pop up on TV down the line. Going to be interesting to see what happens with that when, when, when that transpires. But right now, Ernesto booking, sending Lawler off to Hawaii and do whatever else the king does over the next month. Meanwhile, Jer- or Randy Savage getting built up huge here as the top heel in the territory. But I guess it could have been worse, Gene. We could have got George Goulas. <laughs> That's true. We we could have gotten George Goulas. But, you know, it just makes you wonder when you're you're shipping Lawler off and you don't have a big name in mind to fill that void, you know, why wouldn't you try to squeeze everything you can out of a Dutch mantel or – toy with the idea of maybe turning somebody like Eddie Gilbert. I mean, well, imagine we Eddie saw Gilbert, somebody turn Randy last Savage week, feud, you know, somebody that people might give a shit about. You know, do you, do you think that the coincidence is there that Jerry Lawler leaves at the same time Seeky comes in and turns face? Do you oh, think no. they thought I mean, initially Lawler essentially gave him his, you know, he basically signed off on him, you know, with them doing mm-hmm. that little promo together out there and Lawler, you know, was his friend. And that's, uh, yeah, I, I think that was basically, that was, in their mind, Renesto's mind, that's Lawler basically signing off on, hey, this guy right here, he's, he's the man. And uh, the fans were like, mm, no, no, he's not. <laughs> he's not the well, boy that Tux Newman's trying to tell us he is, but he's no. not the man. Uh, we found that out in record time. Siki just not going to work there in the main event department. As uh, we continue on, though, a couple of shows here on Saturday, March the 30th in Paris, Tennessee, Henry County High School, sponsored by the Paris Henry County JCs featuring Eddie Gilbert, Constance, and Ashley, and the fabulous ones there. Meanwhile, over in Nashville, also Saturday night on March the 30th, Tracy Smothers versus Tom Branch, Jerry Oski taking on the Angel, Debbie Combs and Speedy Talltree teaming up against Adrian Street and Miss Linda, Sweet Daddy Seeky one-on-one with Lanny Poffo. Boy, that would have been interesting. <laughs> the Battens and the PYTs, and Dutch Mantel challenging Southern Heavyweight Champion, Randy Savage, boy, you look at the roster, and yeah, Dutch Mantel, the only man right now in line for a title shot. Absolutely, I mean, he makes the most sense to plug in there against that man. Can you imagine? You know, you kind of you kind of pointed out that it seemed like maybe Ernesto was wanting to push Seeky into that Lawler spot. Can you imagine a Southern title match between Randy Savage and Sweet Daddy Seeky based on the matches we've seen out of Seeky so far? Oh man, yeah, that would have been very intriguing. You know, like I wish I could go back in that DeLorean you talked about earlier, and <laughs> and book that match. Like, sign me up all day. I don't care if I had to make a, a five-hour drive to go check that one out. It would have been worth my money, worth my time to get there. See Savage sell that headbutt with <laughs> his fly across the ring. <laughs> See Seeky refuse to get tossed to the floor. Yes. <laughs> he goes to toss him to the floor. He just hits the rope and just stops. Turns back around, headbutts him. That does not work for me. Tut, 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 brother. <laughs> tut, tut, tut. <laughs> I don't know what that means, brother. But, uh, well, we move ahead a day, and we don't get the Jerry Lawler show featuring Lance Russell as the host, so no Pon Pom Girls, no Sweet Daddy Seeky, but we do get a Mid-South Coliseum card taking place 8 p.m., seven big matches, kind of light on the matches as well. Been used to eight to ten matches lately here at the Coliseum, but only seven. Let's see what they do with it. It's going to be Steve Constance over J.R. Hogg in singles competition, Tim Ashley scoring a win over Mr. Wrestling. Ugh. Going to split these guys up and make us watch them twice? And that, and if you think they don't have plans, if you, if you weren't sure they didn't have plans for J.R. Hogg and Mr. Wrestling, <laughs> they're putting over Steve Constance and Tim Ashley in singles matches. There you go. Yeah, they're on their way out. Speaking of on their way out, looks like the exotic Adrian Street may also not be here much longer as he's going to do a job, a pinfall loss to Jerry Oski. Wow, yeah, Adrian was like the Roddy Piper of the area. Like, you just didn't see Adrian decide her <laughs> getting pinned. No, he wasn't going to lose a match unless he wanted to. Absolutely. <laughs> Tag team action. Hey, we saw the bat and score the win on TV, but it's a no-go here at the Coliseum doing the job to the PYTs. So much for that training. Man, I mean, you think when you get sound advice from guys who couldn't beat those guys, that they would have known what they were talking about, how to not get beaten by those guys. So. Uh... <laughs> 
little lesson for everybody there. Well, we saw the showdown at the end of the program. Uh, Eddie Gilbert knocking out Dutchman, tell, knocking him silly anyway. The Dutchman comes back for revenge here at the Coliseum, but the two men battling to a time limit draw, it would appear. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Let's let's shoot a hot angle on TV where somebody gets knocked out with brass knuckles and then come back to a draw. <laughs> Man, Renesto is not making a good showing for himself on uh, being a booker to come in and uh, light the territory up since it was all <laughs> since it was getting stale with Jerry Jarrett and Jerry Lawler. Woo, Renesto. You know- uh, doing the show I do, The Wrestling Stoop with Bob Roop, it's kind of funny because we go from territory to territory and look at the different bookers. And you have bookers who, whether they, you know, it's their boys or not, if they see somebody's getting over and somebody's going to make them money, they're going to book them the way you would book them. Dutch Mantel, Eddie Gilbert, whatever. You would put the, put them at least in the semi-main. But you also run into bookers where they just come in and change everything overnight. Makes no sense. Bringing in their boys, their guys. And they don't seem to work there. They don't draw a dime, but they'll be damned. You know, they're going to put get their own guys over. Think about Robert Fuller coming into Georgia at the end of 1980. The first thing he does is set himself as a main eventer, which is fine. I love Robert Fuller. But at the same time, making his partner Plowboy Frazier. I just don't know what he was. This was not Alabama 1976, right? Yeah, that just boggles the mind. Of <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I like Robert Fuller. Um, and he's had his moments, but overall, you really can't point to any long, long periods of success he's had as a booker. It's Not as a booker, small right. doses. Yeah, I think he lasted about three weeks there or three months there in Georgia. But I want to go back to this and just thinking about the different bookers and the different styles and what they do. And I think Renesto's a mixture of both. He knows he can't get rid of Jerry Lawler. But at the same time, here he has talent like Eddie Gilbert, very much so Dutch Mantell. I mean, the fans know Dutch. You don't have to push him from the, you know, he's not, it's not coming in from scratch, right? People know him. He's already immediately thrown into that semi main, that main event slot. We're talking about him working savage on these house shows, but here, you know, he gets knocked out with the brass knuckles and they come back and do a wrestling match battling to a draw. And how do you follow that up guys with a battle of Ontario matchup talking about sweet daddy Siki taking on iron Mike sharp to Torontoians or Ontarioans or something like that. And you couldn't just put Seeky over? What is he? I mean, why is he winning by DQ against Mike Sharp? It's not like we've kept Mike Sharp strong recently. Right. So we go from a draw to a disqualification. Sweet Daddy Seeky, who's the big name that, that was supposed to replace Jerry Lawler, a fast forward a week later, and he can't even beat Iron Mike Sharp. And they haven't been doing anything with Sharp either since Ernesto took over. No. Once he dropped that Mid-America title, it's just been a bunch of nothing. So we've had a draw, we've had a disqualification, but let's see what happens in the main event. Remember, guys, Macho Man Randy Savage, the Southern Heavyweight Champion, teaming with brother Leaping Lanny Poffo, going to score the win over the Southern Tag Team Champion, Fabulous Ones, on a countout. Man, I tell you what, we've uh, we've had a lot of <laughs> ill will lately over on the USWA podcast with all these non-finishes and DQs and count outs and stuff and this just tells me the more we see this stuff man this stuff plagued memphis for years and years and it doesn't go away no it doesn't but already a light card with only seven matches here and then you get four preliminaries so to speak and obviously we're getting finishes in those matches and then we come to the big three the ones that everybody paid to see and every one of them ending in a schmoz in some way shape or form is the not very good right now. And Jerry Lawler not on the card as well, I should point out. So I'm not really sure what they did uh, money-wise on this one, the gate. But I, I can't imagine it was uh, one of their biggest successes of all time. I can't either. And, man, you think, like, first card you're coming in with no Lawler, you think you'd want to bring the heat and do some really strong finishes or at least some finishes with some heat to bring the stuff back. Let, you know, Savage and Poffo do something strong to the fabs rather than a count out that would bring us back to something next week. I mean, and I don't know, maybe, maybe the count out something happened where there, it was a lot of heat, but I can't imagine it was That's such a count out is such a disappointing finish, especially in a main event. Yeah, man. It just, I would have thought you'd want to have a lot better showing if you're, if you're trying to do away with Lawler for a while, how does the Mantell and Gilbert draw just really with the, the, the angle they used on TV with brass knucks and all that, why you would come out of that to a draw just blows my mind. 
And you can go back to that booking uh, process of, let's see, we only have seven matches. we got to stretch something. I'm not doing anything with these two guys. So those are the guys I'm going to throw out there and have them do the 20-minute draw or whatever the time limit was there. And that's what it feels like here. It's like, well, we don't have a whole lot of matches this week, so we got to stretch some things. And let's throw those two guys out there because I'm not interested in those two anyway. Yeah, and that's what it was. But I would have been like, well, man, we at least got to have Seeky beat Sharp because we can't have three right. non-finishes in a row. But we can't oh, yes, do we that. can. <laughs> oh, pal. <laughs> well, I don't have any results for Monday, April Fool's Day, because the Coliseum card was on the Sunday. So we move into a brand new month, guys, April 2nd. We're now in the month of April, going to the Louisville Gardens Tuesday night. Action going to see Mark Batten over Mr. Wrestling on a DQ, really. Tommy Gilbert refusing to do the job to the baton there. Oh, my God. Okay, we're we're starting out hot here. Uh, <laughs> Mark Batten can't beat Mr. Wrestling, but by DQ. Well, there's a few people in the crowd that know who I am. I'm not doing a job to a baton. I've been watching TV for a while now. I know what's going on here. As uh, Iron Mike Sharp scoring a win over the other bad baton, Brad. It's Then it's uh, mixed tag team action. Adrian Street, Miss Linda over Debbie Combs and Mark Batten. I guess Speedy Talltree couldn't make Louisville. Jerry Oski going to a draw here with Leaping Lanny Poffo. Eddie Gilbert over Sweet Daddy Seeky on a count out. What's that about? Wow, that I don't know what to say about that. I mean, I was already kind of rattled by Jerry Oski draw having a draw with Lanny Poffo, and then Gilbert gets a win over Seeky, but it's by a count out. Like, well, I could be wrong, but I don't know if we're going to see Seeky beyond this week of uh, house show results. So uh, I'm not 100% on that, but uh, we'll have to wait until the next episode to, to find out. Uh, but we look at some more results here. Ashley and Constance, Constance and Ashley, over the team of Coco Ware and Billy Travis. Where the hell is Norvell Austin? Where is Norvell Austin and how is Billy Travis suddenly <laughs> tagging with the heel Coco Ware? They just wrestled each other in a TV match, did they not? It was just a couple episodes of a regional wrestling ago with you. I, I think yeah. I said I would have liked to have seen these two team up, but in their peak gimmick years, at least Billy Joe Travis's peak gimmick years. You willed this to happen, right? Look what you did. You <laughs> went back and altered time and space. Well, I'm not uh, going to fess up could, or anything like that. But you could, you could have, you, uh, Let me just say, you could have used that <laughs> a lot better, sir. If I knew I, you had that ability, we would have picked a better <laughs> example. <laughs> yeah, I would have removed Tux Newman altogether and maybe, I don't know. <laughs> Oh. oh, well, we talked about it. We saw it once. We're going to see it again here in Louisville this time. Randy Savage, the Southern champion, scoring a win over Dutch Mantel. So, yeah, with the king gone, it only makes sense to throw somebody in there that's credible as a challenger in the main event with no background, no story involved. Dutch Mantel taking on the champ, Randy Savage, but the Macho Man scoring the win. Well, I mean, no complaints here. Savage and Dutch is a good match. Like I said, I would have liked to have had some story there and – Maybe they did something on the Louisville TV feed, promos at least, that jazzed it up or something, but it's what we got. Well, outside of that opening DQ, which still boggles my mind, it looks like we got clean finishes, or at least finishes, pinfall finishes every match for the duration, so I guess the Louisville fans have to leave somewhat happy. Maybe their favorites didn't necessarily win, but at least they got to see finishes that night. Well, except the draw with Poffo and Oski and the oh, yeah, good call the draw. Gilbert countout. <laughs> Oh, there is a count. Well, okay, I fucked. Never mind. Scratch all of that, guys. Thank thank God for Gene here. Reading reading over my notes again. Yeah, As, I'm uh, salty <laughs> about all the non finishes in Memphis for decades now. It's, it's, I just talked about that Gilbert finish. I should have remembered that one. Well, you got excited there was a finish in the main event. And it, <laughs> threw me off. Threw me did. for a loop. <laughs> I'm I, speaking of reading your notes, when you get to one here in a minute, I'm gonna fall out of my chair. <laughs> All right. Sounds good. April the 4th, Thursday, Lexington, Kentucky, the old Rupp Arena. Going to see Tim Ashley over Mr. Wrestling. Steve Constance defeat Adrian Street. Boy, you know what Adrian on his way out. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, they are no longer enamored with Adrian's face paint. <laughs> the, the thrill is gone. Uh, the first thing I thought of when I saw this, what happened? Did he not show up in face paint for this show? Clearly not, because <laughs> holy shit. Wow. Steve Constance of the two. I mean, Tim Ashley's the better of the two, I do believe. Exactly. He <laughs> wrestled the one who can't do the bam. Oh, my God. Okay. All right. I'm, I'm just going to move past that. Well, it happened, guys. Were you there in the Rupp Arena, Lexington, Kentucky, April 4th, 1985? 
Did you witness history? Steve Constance scoring a win over the exotic Adrian Street. If you got pictures, send them our way. Also on the card, Jerry Oski going to a draw with Iron Mike Sharp. Can't wait to see that again in WWF world. It's the Batten Twins over Coco Ware and Billy Travis. Well, I guess Travis is nearly a pretty young thing officially, at least <laughs> at least in the house shows. So this is kind of confusing to me, and I got to do some more digging here. But this is the second time in two weeks I've seen this listed. Uh, the matchup is actually Sweet Daddy Seeky over J.R. Hogg. But now two weeks in a row, I've seen results with J.R. Hogg with the word Mr. X written next to it. And I have to wonder, are they putting Hogg out there under a hood? Or is this just some kind of a typo I'm running into in my results? It's a strange one to have twice in a row, that's for sure, on the same yeah. name. Yeah. Uh, more uh, ladies' action here this week. Going to see Debbie Combs over Miss Linda by disqualification. Fabulous ones. Defeating the team of Eddie Gilbert and Lanny Poffo. And in the main event, one more time, Southern champion Randy Savage over Dutch Mantell. All right. Well, we're, uh, we're going ahead and getting the use we can out of Dutch while he's here, I guess. Well, we're going to close up shop here this week and stop by Blavel. Is that good? Blavel, Arkansas. That's it. American yeah. Legion Arena, April the 5th, Friday night. Action involving Southern champion Randy Savage, the PYTs, Dutch Mantell, Constance and Ashley, and another ladies match between Debbie Combs and Miss Linda there in Blavel. <laughs> we'll, we'll make a proper Southerner out of you yet, Ray. Oh, I've, I've heard that talk my whole life. I'm, I'm halfway there. <laughs> but uh, that's going to wrap it up here this week guys kind of a light show not a whole lot going on jerry the lawler jerry lawler written out though that was a big angle to kick the show off with it was and uh pretty well executed by randy savage like i say i didn't i didn't love the follow-up but you know when you got randy left to his own devices uh you got to kind of just swallow you know and deal with the lanny poffo that comes with it so well, I, you know, I go back and I think, well, if I was fantasy booking and people would say that was overbooking, how would I have Randy Savage write Jerry Lawler out? It was pretty much identical to what you would see in a fantasy writing thing, right? You would see, well, you got to throw him outside, got to do the double axe handle and then bring him back in, give him a pile driver, but not just any pile driver, do it on something. Obviously the, the golden firewood holder and then uh, dropping two elbows, but with the Southern title wrapped around his arm. So just adding insult to injury, injury to injury, really sending the king out for a month. And uh, that's that's a pretty long time for Jerry Lawler. Maybe he's going to go spend another month in uh, Ontario with the uh, sick kids or something. <laughs> yeah, hey, maybe he can hook back up with Seeky in Ontario once Seeky runs out of here screaming pretty soon. Very curious to see where we go from here with a lot of these guys. I do know what's going to happen with a couple of them. Looking forward to talking about that next time. But you guys have been warned, Jerry Lawler out of action for the next few weeks. We will see the king return before too long. But in the meantime, can't wait to see what Tom Ernesto does next to keep the fans tuning in and keep them coming to the Coliseum uh, with the talent they do have. And so we'll see what happens next time around, guys, here on the Memphis 85 edition of Regional Wrestling. Yes, sir. We've uh, we've made it through another one, and uh, it's kind of a it's kind of a mixed bag right now. You know, uh, Randy Savage is Southern champion. I think that's something we all kind of secretly hoped for and and longed for, and we've got it. Uh, and honestly, I'm not real well versed in '85 um, as far as having seen it a lot over the years. Mm -hmm. So I don't remember how long this Renesto experiment goes on. Well, I got some bad news for you. It goes on for a while still. Oh, my. So uh, <laughs> so that's that makes it interesting, though, because it's not predictable, that's for sure. No, that that's one thing it is not. I don't think Renesto knows what he's going to do week to week. And then you talked about <laughs> a mixed bag. I mean, we saw it right here this week in the same segment. We kick things off. It's very serious. Eddie Marlin out there, matchmaker and, and overall businessman here for the, uh, the Memphis Territory. And they're talking about the big angle that took place. We see Jerry Lawler taken out on a stretcher. Big deal. And then we cut away to a Lanny Poffo promo in a suit of armor. Yes, we are all over the place here. Coco Ware nearly committing criminal acts in the ring, but then we've got a four-way promo with the Constance and Ashley along with the Batten Twins. Uh, <laughs> it's, man, it's it's something. Well, people watching ahead or people that know where this is going next, they're probably looking at us like, or at least looking at me like I'm an idiot because I don't really watch ahead. I got so many different projects going on. I really can't afford to watch ahead, not because 
I don't enjoy it, but well, time consumption as well. But at the same time, I don't want to get confused as to what happened on what episode. And, and you know how, what I'm talking about, Gene, in regards to, we talk, start talking about something that hasn't happened yet. And, and it gets really confusing that way. So I don't like to go too far ahead, but I, do, I, I could swear the PYTs are going to be back in full force. I mean, maybe somebody out there is going, Norville Austin don't come back, but I feel like they're here for a while. For the purposes of what we do, I have found, and it, it took a little bit of experiment to realize this, but I have, I mean, even though we've seen all this in the past, I have found if it's not fresh in your mind, it makes it more fun to talk about uh, when you don't have it right at the edge of your mind of what's coming, for me at least. And I find it kind of affects how I perceive things and how I talk about it if I don't automatically know where it's immediately headed and what's happening right around the corner. So uh, I'm intentionally not watching ahead. I'm just kind of, as you put them out, uh, when it gets kind of close to time for us to do the show, I'll watch it. But I'm definitely not watching the one after the one before we record it because I just I kind of don't want to know where it's going because I want to kind of experience it as much in real time as we can. Right. Yeah, it's yeah, as close can. to real time as we can get. Obviously, we know some things are going to happen. I know Jerry Lawler will return to Memphis, believe it or not, guys. But yeah. we'll have to see what happens and how he returns and what's going to happen between the King and the Macho Man before too long. But right now, uh, we're getting ready to close up, Gene. But before we do, we got to take a time out here. I want you to... Let everyone know a lot of the things you got going on here in the rest in the world of WrestleCopia. Well, man, uh, we are still having a lot of fun every week with the retro wrestling review, reviewing USWA from 1993. We're got we're getting into April now. Uh, Scotty Flamingo is here, tagging up with Brian Christopher. Burt Prentice has just recently left. These things don't always line up when they come out, so I won't talk about what's dropping this week because it probably won't be. It'll probably be a couple weeks old when this comes out. But, uh, you know, we've had some some fun things with uh, a, a USWA version of Wrestle War and WWF people coming to town. And then we got weeks where nobody from WWF's coming to town, so it's kind of up and down. You know, my co host, uh, Josh and Richard, they've been able to consistently do it with me every week, and we've kind of figured things out where we can kind of keep them around. So that's been fun, keeping the same co-host where we're all kind of experienced it, going along through it together, and uh, you know, you kind of remember what things that connect from two or three weeks ago. Where when you're rotating co-hosts, that's not necessarily you know they just know what they just watched that week. So I found that that's made the show really fun. We're getting a lot of great feedback, and uh, I feel like we're gaining followers all the time. So Really excited about that. Dangerous conversations with Doug Gilbert. You know, we're several weeks in now, and uh, we're starting to get some guests lined up, and we're talking about Doug's career and Eddie's career and Mr. Tommy's career, and Doug's getting more and more comfortable with, the, you know, with this whole podcasting concept, and uh, he's having fun telling stories, and I'm having fun asking questions about things I've always wanted to know and, and things that come up on the USWA podcast and things that come up on this podcast because i'm gonna ask doug next time i talk to him hey man when did eddie start using the hot shot as a finish and uh <laughs> we'll see if he remembers we'll kind of test his test his memory uh but uh I, i'm getting to where uh you know we do these we have these podcasts and, and i usually talk to doug a couple times during the week and float things by him and, and ask him questions and we're having a lot of fun. We we just recorded one with the dirty white boy that'll be coming out soon, and I got a chance to ask him a regional wrestling 1985 related question where I asked him about the Terminators. So, uh, <laughs> folks, make sure you check out that episode and see what the dirty white boy had to say about our old friends, the Terminators. Who, right about now, maybe I'm kind of missing them in some ways, but. Not really. I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, that's uh, that's pretty damn good stuff. Yeah, Doug Gilbert's been a blast to listen to thus far here on the network, and just looking forward to all the things he's got, you know, to tell stuff. He's got so many stories left to share, thousands of them, I'm sure. So, uh, just getting started there with the Dangerous Conversations podcast. For those who have missed it, Bob Smith, the former managing editor of Pro Wrestling Illustrated, the wrestler, eventually went on to work for WCW magazine in the 1990s as well. Bob Smith, now a part of the WrestleCopia Podcast Network with his Outdated Wrestling Hour podcast. So happy to have him here as well. Go check that out. Now part of WrestleCopia.com. And, of course, all of your favorite podcast streaming apps and uh, all the other great shows. Of course, the Wrestling Memory Grenade. Gene, we just recently did the VIP video cast of WrestleFest 88. What a great time. Nearly three hours of fun, 15 matches, 
We sat down and we did it all. And it was just a great time. Hogan and Andre in the cage, Jake and Rude, uh, DiBiase and Savage, even the Rougeos and the Killer Bees. What a right hand from B. Brian Blair there. And uh, we, we encourage you guys to go over and check that out over there at the patreon.com slash WrestleCopia, part of that VIP super fan tier, Gene. Lots more video casts coming. The Pearl Academy video cast with Dan Gennetti and uh, SummerSlam 88 right around the corner as well. Man, I had so much fun doing that WrestleFest video cast with you and and to be honest i can't tell you when three hours has gone by that fast like yeah. when we got to that cage match i was like man really we're already here <laughs> uh you know a lot of fun doing that i really enjoy doing those with you and uh look forward to doing more but man i cannot tell you uh, you know we've talked about this you kind of let me in on from the beginning kind of what the plans were that you and Dan had for the Puro Wrestling Academy, especially the video side of things and all this video that Dan has. And now that it's starting to come to fruition, I am so excited. I have upgraded uh, to the super fan tier and I can't wait folks. I'm telling you when you see what these guys have in store for you there and all this rare, super rare footage. And for me, the big selling point is being able to watch old Japanese matches with American commentary or, and these guys adding context and explaining some things because, you know, I used to watch the matches and enjoy the, you know, the moves for what they were, but I had no <laughs> idea what they were fighting for or what, what the stakes sure. were a lot of times. Yeah. Uh, and so, man, I'm enjoying the podcast, but man, these video casts are going to be a whole new level. So yeah, and, thank and you, you know, guys for doing it. Oh well, yeah. And then you talk about, yeah, we're going to be calling the action and we're going to be putting context to everything there with the Japanese videos. But that's another thing I wanted to point out right before we close up shop here, go back to WrestleFest just momentarily. Me and Gene spend most of the time just talking about random things, the guys in the ring and, and past memories and all sorts. We go off the rails so many times, but in good ways, very entertaining ways, I would say, but we stick to the wrestling as well. But we're not sitting here calling play by play. There's a kick. There's a punch. Obviously, you guys can see that sort of thing. And it's not really what we do here. And so we, we just had a blast laughing and having a good time all throughout all three hours of the program of the video cast there for WrestleFest. We hope you guys give it a try. Check it out. I think you'll enjoy it. It's pinned right now at the top of the Patreon. Again, just join that VIP super fan tier. More coming around the corner. But just want to get back to that. You guys can actually watch the video. But at the same time. We could be talking about who knows what. So we're going to have a great time and we encourage you to leave us feedback. Let us know maybe some of the topics you want us to talk about in upcoming video casts and things of that nature. So going to be a fun time as we continue on. Gene, you're always welcome back to the video cast. And uh, yeah, we got plenty more around the corner with that. And we got plenty more regional wrestling coming. Hey, we're just kicking off April in 1985. Yeah, man. 85 is uh, we're still we're not even near halfway through it, man. So there's a lot of. A lot of stuff that can still unfold here in 85. So I'm looking forward to see what happens. And like I've told you before, as far as those video casts go, anytime you uh, you need somebody to do those, you can always tag me in. I don't want to hog them. If there's other people that want to do them, by all means, give them an opportunity. But push comes to shove. I'm your guy. Well, that you guys heard it right here on Regional Wrestling. But uh, for this episode, we're going to close it up here. Gene, want to thank you again for being a part. We're going to do this again very soon. Sounds good, man. Looking forward to it as always. All right, guys, that'll do it here this week. But we shall return for more Georgia 81, Memphis 85, and UWF 86 very soon. I'm your host, Ray Russell. You can follow me on X at Wrestling Grenade. That's at R-A-S-S-L-I-N Grenade. Also, follow and like me, Facebook.com slash Wrestling Grenade. And don't forget that $5 all access here over at Patreon.com slash WrestleCopia. And until next time, we'll be back soon with more regional wrestling, where we talk the territories. Mm-hmm.